And we are live on YouTube Live. Again, this is the way here from the Money Lab. Uh, every week we start off with a little soft intro on YouTube to kind of give YouTube a chance for everybody to kind of like hear about the Money Lab starting up. I have our guest here today. Say hello, guest. Hello, guest. Actually, your name is not guest. Your name is Jan Farr. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> <laughs> okay, cool. <laughs> yeah, so uh, so now that we got this going, the usual, we're going to go ahead and fire it up on the um, on the inside for the audio only participants. So stay tuned. Here we go. All right, welcome to the Money Lab Live podcast, episode number 81 The Every Culture is Different Money Story. Welcome back to another live broadcast of the Money Lab podcast from the Six Figure Academy. I am your host, Wei Hong from the Six Figure Academy. Now, this is the podcast where we give you tips, strategies, and interviews with other entrepreneurs on how to create that ultimate six figure entrepreneurial lifestyle free of bad money stories, money anxiety, and stress so that you can monetize your dreams and execute your genius. Now, if you haven't already downloaded our free ebook from Money Anxiety to Six Figure Mastery, make sure you go to go.thesixfigureacademy.com and get it there. It's the perfect complement to all the things we discuss on this show and quite frankly, it could change your life. Now, if you're joining us live today and you're not on YouTube Live, make sure you go to or you get on Spreaker.com or download the Spreaker app on your mobile device and search for the hashtag. Hashtag, that's that pound sign for those who don't know what hashtag is pound hashtag the money lab so that you can join us in the chat room ask questions and interact with us and our guests now while you're there subscribe so that you don't miss an episode you can catch us every week for all of the ways to find us go to the sixfigureacademy.com forward slash radio for all the details now if there's something you love about what you hear on this episode today that you know could help someone you care about Remember, sharing is caring. So share this show to that person. Now, today's episode is being sponsored by the Energy Mind Body Transformational Experience events, EMBTE, which runs live, no pitch, full day events, where the goal is to have that one shift, one transformational experience to help you optimize your energy, mind, and body. Go to www.embte for more details on the upcoming events. Now, I'm really excited about our show today because what we're going to do is we're going to dive deep into the world of how different cultures will actually have like different perspectives and different relationships with money. And what I want to make sure that you, the listeners, listen for today on the show is not just about how cultures play a role and how our money stories play out no matter where we are, but also kind of the journey, kind of embracing kind of evolution of money and understanding that because our guest today is kind of an expert in that area. So before I introduce my guest today, I'm going to go through a little bit about his credentials because this guy has is internationally viably friendly, okay? And so he's going to bring a lot to the table today. He's a he's not only a, a successful uh, entrepreneur, entrepreneur type of individual. He's a dad. He's a husband. Uh, he's a real estate lending specialist. He's got a really cool story that I can't wait for him to share for you guys. And then he basically, in this day and time, he helps people realize their dream home anywhere in California. And let's talk a little bit about his background too. I mean, basically he has a strong academic background in business administration, so he didn't just go start in the real estate industry. And he presented business papers in local, international conferences, seminars, workshops, so he's totally comfortable in this type of a platform. He published a book with the title called Student Satisfaction Checklist. I'm not really sure what that's all about, but we're gonna find out, I'm sure. And then um, basically he in there, he actually presented a few examples of, of the application of the Lean Six Sigma to customer service improvement, and I wanna find out what that's all about because he got his Six Sigma green belt from UCLA. I wasn't in that class or in that dojo, but we'll figure. I guess we'll figure out what that is, right? <laughs> okay, cool. So he also curated a Manhattan Beach TEDx session. I don't know why I wasn't invited, but no, that's okay. He probably didn't even know me back then. <laughs> On the title of Choosing Happiness back in 2011. Super accomplished. Can't wait for him to share even more. before. So before I take up the whole entire episode, just going over his long list of credentials, 
Welcome to the show, Mr. Yan. Thank you so Bard. much for having me. First yeah. of all, happy birthday, if I may say. Oh yeah, that's right. <laughs> I was trying to avoid that, yeah. and you totally kind of blew it out. So now, so so now, yeah, this is a very special episode, and people are like, "What are you doing, working on your birthday?" Well, because it's Yan Far, and oh, I have to do thanks. something, and it's he's worth doing it oh, on my birthday. Appreciate it. <laughs> Hope you don't regret it. <laughs> well, we'll see, won't we? Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so cool. I mean, and there's so many different things that you've done in your life, and you know. Before we had a chance to get you even scheduled on the show, you and I got a chance to sit down, talk about a few things and everything. And 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 I and and so I'm really fascinated about and I'm excited about you being able to share how you got to where you are today. But let's first start off and just get that out of the way. What was the money story? Since this is the money lab, right? right. So what tell our audience over there, what is what was your money story that you grew up with? Because you weren't from the US originally. No. Okay, so I'm fascinated. Okay, where are you from originally? I'm, uh, I was born back in Iran. Iran. Okay, cool. Yeah. So, so uh, per today's title of the show, which is you know every culture, culture is a little different. bit different, right? right? Tell me about the money story that you grew up. I'm really excited about this because I I didn't even know until you told me what the what the currency was called That's over right. in Iran. That's What's right. it called again? It's called rials. Rials. R I A L S. S rials. That's right. Okay. And cool. They have a sort of a slash rials versus two months where they drop a zero. Uh-huh. So because it's too uh, sort of devalued. They they try to <laughs> sort of cut it like okay. shorter. So uh, one U.S. dollar per I would say current uh, you know rates will be hundred fifty thousand. Uh, hundred uh, and fifty thousand yeah. per one dollar. That's right. Okay, what can you buy for? What can okay in Iran right now? What can you buy for one hundred fifty thousand reals? Nothing. It's uh, it's, <laughs> it's kind of like when German was going through That's this whole right, Germany yeah. was going through where they're like doing cartloads of like money. <laughs> exactly. And, they, money. and people stole the wheelbarrow and left the money because the wheelbarrow was more <laughs> valuable than the money. So. So if that's is that kind of how it is over there? It is. It's funny. Can you even buy a pack of gum for one hundred fifty thousand real? If you give it to a beggar, uh, I'm sure they will be upset because it's. Uh, oh, it's a, insulting it's, to give one hundred fifty thousand. Yeah. Is, and is it in one like sheet or is no, it? No, it's like the, the lowest they have is probably a uh, hundred thousand. Uh, uh, worth of so reals. one dollar is like a stack of a hundred. Th- like it's like they have it in pennies. Oh my god! Yeah, it's like it's not worth it as much. Uh, so, so so it's devalued. Uh, but going back to the question of money story, I will yeah. be talking about how things started. You uh-huh. know? So first, my money story. I think it's a it's a great uh, you know question. I like that because yeah. it sort of <laughs> lets you talk about money. <laughs> right. Exactly. And well, more importantly, what kind of guided you in this lifetime when it came to money? Because you know, um, just as a reminder for our audience, is that you know your money circumstance today is dictated to some degree by the money story that you grew up with. That's so true. And if you're doing well, you probably grew up a really good money story. If you're having financial challenges, you probably have some bad money stories running. That's right. And so you're doing pretty well for yourself, so I'm excited. But everybody starts off with some kind of a money story, and whether or not you get that re-engineered or restructured or anything in your life, that's up to you. Of course, right? Yeah. So tell me about the money story that you grew up with Beautiful. in Iran. Yes. So I was born into a, a middle class family. You uh-huh. know, my dad was living pay- paycheck to paycheck, working uh-huh. really hard, a working class. And so I, I, I remember times where you know it was rough or tough uh, end of the month where mm-hmm. you know uh, for, for for us to uh, you know celebrate or have fun. But m- right. m- my parents. Uh, always try to help us, you know, enjoy, and we have like uh, those weekends where we had family times. Right. So he religiously, like my dad and my uh, my mom, they religiously helped me and my brother to enjoy. Like okay. they never allowed money to become an issue versus, huh. like you know, enjoying your life. Okay. But uh, but as I grew up and I I got to travel, mm-hmm. travel around the world. Like uh, as you know, money is a medium of exchange, as as Merriam Webster dictionary says. It's a way to exchange and uh, get the value or get something mm-hmm. of value. So as I traveled, I got to see every culture has a different meaning or mm-hmm. approach to money. So before you started traveling, what was your definition of money? My Money was just a means. Uh, it wasn't the goal. Uh-huh. And uh, it was just a way to get by. There were uh, like values were uh-huh. more important than money. Okay. Which I think I still hold those uh, mm-hmm. definitions. But and, I st- and how did you know how, what money was used for? I mean, they they had to have shown you something when you were growing up, right? Of course, yeah. It's like uh, they gave us like a uh, one week, like this amount of money for you to buy some stuff. You oh, know? so you you got allowance? Yeah. Oh, okay. So it's not so different than other cultures, of right? Course. I mean, it's pretty much I actually didn't get 
I didn't get allowance, and I think I realized it was a way for my dad to control his kids. But anyway, that's <laughs> that's a whole different story right there. I mean, we don't, yeah, that's a whole different episode too. No, anyway, <laughs> but um, so so they they showed you they they actually the had money, money talk of course with you. I mean, that's they talked right. to you about money and everything. Sure. Was it your dad or your mom that talked to you about money? It was both of them. Oh, really? My okay. my mom was a she was a teacher when, okay. I, when we were born, and but she she just resigned to focus on. You know, nurturing us sure. and teaching us, but they both had conversations. So money was not a taboo in our house. We could mm. easily talk about it, and if we had concerns or we needed money, right? You know, but we we had to earn it also. It right. wasn't like, oh, I need this much money. Here you go. You got to work for it. Yeah. Okay. So and and Iran, I mean, were most families like that in Iran, or do you- not? Not quite. My 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 parents were educated, so uh, you know, they they sort of had gone through mm-hmm. the. Uh, uh, understanding of the mm-hmm. concept a little bit deeper, but I would say probably every family. Uh, it's funny when we travel, we'll see how much similar people are. Yeah. Even though there are a lot of differences in you know cultures and right. countries. Right. But bottom line, people are pretty people similar. People are people. Yeah. Right. And, like and the Pesh Mode says, that, people yeah. are people. <laughs> so why can't it be? Yeah. You can't. <laughs> so so the, the similarities blows one's mind. Uh, like uh, I remember, uh, I lived in Malaysia or uh-huh. Southeast Asia for uh-huh. a while. Where you know uh, the, it's the country is very interesting country right. where there are three major races that are uh, predominantly uh, living there in Malaysia. There Chinese, Malays, Chinese, Malays. <laughs> Chinese is everywhere. Yes, <laughs> <laughs> like a virus. <laughs> They're actually the second uh, largest group. So the sure. first are Malays, uh-huh. seconds are uh, Chinese, and the third are Indians. Okay. So these three group are living together peacefully, mm-hmm. and they all have their. The different definitions of money and approach to money and, and what, what would business. you see with the difference between those three cultures living within one country what the what the difference is in terms of their each of their approaches to money or their definitions of money what money is I would say the the, the majority are the Malays mm-hmm. where they are sort of setting the rules for the rest mm-hmm. so it was a little bit overshadowed uh, the, oh. other, the other two groups okay but uh, the Chinese were mostly the for business so okay. they, they had a better uh, understanding of the money at least in practice okay where all the businesses were mostly Chinese and all that sure so their approach was totally different like you would see like if you go back to history how mm-hmm. they came into the country mm-hmm. you know some of them they were trying to survive so the survival mode was there okay they were saving religiously to for the hard times uh-huh. you know uh-huh. so so their, their approach was uh, living below your means, even though okay. you have enough, you don't necessarily have to spend all the money you have. Okay. So, and so lifestyle was not really kind of a priority for them. But for some groups, not. Yeah, for that's some right. groups, I mean, You'll, they, I mean, live so frugally. I mean, I know this about our my culture. Right. It's like they live so frugally. It's like, really? What? I even mean, though they have a lot. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> it is so ridiculous. And then you see movies like Crazy Rich Asians. You're like, okay, cool. We know the other side too. That's right. That's right. You What's will see on? both sides there. Yeah, absolutely. Right. So it's it's funny. And then bottom line, you will see they all want to uh, survive, have a living, have a good family, right. great time. And mm-hmm. uh, so end of the day, even though you go to, uh, like you just travel a little bit further to Singapore, right. you will see a little bit more advanced, deeper understanding of money. So okay. it's just, uh, but, but bottom line is the same. Uh-huh. You have a family, you want to uh, live a, a, a meaningful life. Help your children, uh, huh. you know, be successful. Okay. So, end of the day, is the yeah. same thing. Uh, How about the Indian side? You said it's yeah, it's for them. They they are pretty successful in their group also, mm-hmm. but uh, because they had they came through the colonial uh, times, right. you know, the British colony. Oh, they yeah. have that mindset of um, you know survival more uh, okay sort of, uh, close to heart, and that's why you will see they really try hard to succeed and uh, uh-huh. it's it, it could be a little bit tougher for them how do they use money in that in that regard then they are more that you've seen conservative if you will even they, more than the well okay so what's the difference between conservative and the frugality of the chinese culture that you observed in malaysia they risk less they risk less yeah. oh okay right because not a, not so much as business they're that's even right. more conservative it's just they want it as long as they have enough that that's that's good enough i mean of course the educated level they are mm-hmm. more into like risking and succeeding and flourishing mm-hmm. their, their assets mm-hmm. but when you compare the groups you will see chinese they're more willing to take risk okay because they came in for business and they wanted gotcha. to uh, sort of do all the risk that they can mm-hmm. to 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 expand their right. their wealth whereas huh. the indians they're more conservative on just keeping or holding on to what they have right and of course the uh the, the higher the education level or experience 
they they follow the same international huh. rules of of uh, you know money. That's but fascinating. You, yeah, I mean, I mean, because they're so well traveled, you literally have seen this firsthand. Different cultures and how different cultures, and because you work in the space of money, you know, um, I don't think we even shared what it is specifically you do, but I'll give you a chance. Yeah, of course, <laughs> <laughs> um, but. It, it's probably even more you're probably even more sensitive and because of your background what you studied because you went to college in Malaysia too that's right, right? That's right. and you studied business and you yeah, studied about, and you learned about money and yes. economy and everything like that right. so so just seeing how cultures over generations and how that has shaped their different money stories like a, a baseline money story one is survival one is taking calculated risk but also stay frugal so that you can continue to take those risks right. I feel like almost our, our culture our Chinese culture is that we we take calculated risk and we stay frugal so we can continue to afford to take those calculated risks That's right. versus um, the Indian culture that you saw basically because they were more about surviving because of the colonization and everything like that that they were like okay we got to be frugal with money but to make sure that we can always survive that's right right so seeing though that two time and and did you talk about how malaysians were i mean oh uh, yeah the 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 main group they are sort of in between they mm -hmm. the the rules of the land sort of favors them most out of these three groups right. the malays they they write the rules and all that and and it's changing you know the right the, their spring just happening as uh like recently right. i saw that there was a big change of the government and so a lot of my malaysian friends were happy about it so oh, cool. uh, yeah so there are some good changes happening but the, the idea was where you know the the main group sort of rule uh, writes the rules for the, the other mm. two groups to okay. a certain extent so they are sort of like laid back a little bit further than, yeah <laughs> let's let the chinese and the indian work and then we'll just kind of like capitalize on that's that. right well i mean i i mean they they did come to malaysia that's right, right. to, yeah, do, yeah. to, to but, live and survive right yeah but the main group also same concept they learn from each other to a lot of extent and uh -huh. they are sort of uh, sort of uh, giving and taking from each other's culture. So okay. it's a very dynamic, uh, you know, culture, and there's a lot to be right. learned from it. So what do you think was the biggest difference, having come from Iran to all the way to the, the Malaysia and seeing those, the, the trifecta of different types of Asians over there in terms of how they regard money? How, did you notice that was a, the distinct differences between how money is in the culture of Iran? Yeah, I would say the biggest uh Difference I would see is like uh, I remember when I was there, mm -hmm. uh, one th uh, like more than uh, two third of their income, mm -hmm. the, the the country's income was from tourism. So a big oh in Malaysia yeah it's oh, like wow. uh, at any given time um, there were uh, more than uh, like at least half like almost fifty percent equal to their population were tourists. Mm -hmm. So they had a lot of uh, people traveling there, mm -hmm. and because of that, you will see people from all different walks of life and mm -hmm. different countries. So you would see a lot more interaction, okay. whereas where you know Iran is right now, and there is a not as more uh, as much. You mean open. it's not a big tourist spot, tourist attraction? I mean, it could be, but not right I hear now. There's some beautiful I'm, places over there. There are, yeah, uh, but, but not I mean, right now. <laughs> <laughs> Why not? I don't understand what's going on here. <laughs> But what I mean is like it's not as as easy to travel going uh, sure. back and forth. So that's why it's kind of like a hotel California. You can right. check in, but you we might never leave. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> so, so okay, cool. So so let me ask you this. You know, everybody's money story that they grew up with at some point played a role in some financial challenge in their life. Sure. If we if we kind of suss around it long enough, pay archaeological dig and just find out. Where, how do you think this, um, I mean, where do you think some of the, 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 uh, the shortcomings were with the story that you grew up with, with your parents and everything, focusing, focusing so much more on value and then also having to work for money as opposed to money just giving to you, stuff like that. I mean, in your journey, I mean, was everything perfect? I mean, financially, just oh, up and up and up and up your entire life? No, or, no, definitely oh. not. What? Yeah, really? Far, yeah. <laughs> it's like, well, I thought you were Superman. Oh. And so you're going to come here and show us how to have that perfect linear constant growth no, <laughs> no up and down financial lifestyle that's okay right. so let's talk about that a little bit because that's what's that's what most people like kind of can can can, can relate to because sure. everybody at some point deals with some kind of a hiccup in their financial sometimes people are in bigger hiccups sometimes it's a whole 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 flown blown throw up session but anyway um, what 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 was the 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 money story or the part of the money story that kind of like had an influence on some one of your hiccups in your financial sure. journey. 
So I would say the biggest challenge was like as as we started the you know uh, mm -hmm. our conversation, we mm -hmm. talked about the limitations of uh, you know the currency. Mm -hmm. It was and you know all the you know the power, the purchasing right. power of uh, the uh -huh. currency that I left. So uh, I had to, being a student and working part time, yeah. I had a lot to sort of think about or try to uh, you know live below my means and mm -hmm. try to save and. Uh, you know, be smart with my money. So mm -hmm. it wasn't easy to, uh, you know, spend all the money I wanted because I knew that, you know, my currency is not as strong. So, mm -hmm. so because I remember this uh, memory where I, uh, I was in, uh, like, I was just, I just started the the course and I was going to buy a laptop mm -hmm. uh, with the money my dad sent me and. And then, uh, you know, it was very common. You would go to a uh, money exchange uh, shop and sure. then you'd exchange the dollar. In Malaysia. In Malaysia, okay. yeah. And then they would just uh, give you the U.S. dollar or, you know, uh, uh, you, you, you give, usually give them a U.S. dollar and then you get a the Malaysian ringgit. So there was this guy followed me without me knowing it and then he stole all the money I had. Wow. Yeah, it was like almost three, uh, $3,500 worth Holy cow. of money. So he was just following the, just when did this pop yeah or? And it, yeah it's like they knock you and then they take the oh so got it. and then i realized you that was knock him back and take it back yeah i mean that's, that's what i, I wish done. Like, <laughs> i got chase him down knock him it's like yeah here, here you walk to me now yeah. you walk towards me i'll do yeah. it to you no. i mean you wouldn't even realize yeah. I, I just checked my pocket and the money like was gone. gone yeah so things like that hit you hard when you know you're you're you have limited resources so mm -hmm. i i had those days where you know I had to really be frugal mm -hmm. in the money I had or mm -hmm. I would have spent. So it wasn't easy to to sort of advance and uh, you know grow. Mm -hmm. But I would say I learned a lot. I, I got to work as an RA uh, research assistant or a uh, mm -hmm. TA or you know and also work uh, part time with a consulting company and stuff like. So I grew a lot. I got a lot of stuff right. that I learned that I could use and help me just to financially become more successful right. down the line. And would you say that the story, money story that your parents raised you around and taught you was flawless? I would say so. I would say the fact that value is something you should should be pursuing. It's okay. not about the means because a lot of people think that okay, means uh, justif uh, like and justify the means mm -hmm. and then so they use whatever means. But when you put your goal or right. your principles on top, mm -hmm. then you know that you can't use any means and there, mm -hmm. there are some some values you need to stick to and mm -hmm. that gives you character mm -hmm. and that helps you uh, grow mm -hmm. and uh, and uh, tough times will come and go. Right. But what will not change is your value. And how did you know how to navigate those tough times? Did you guys ever deal with tough times growing up as a kid? Uh, yeah, there were times like my my, my dad, uh, he he wanted to invest. Same thing, we will, okay. hopefully we'll be talking more. Yeah. But I remember when my dad was going to invest and uh, the 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 person who was building the house, we, they were, uh, he was buying a house. Okay. And then the guy ended up, like the owner, the investor ended up like, cheating and he was selling the same land to many people it was a project so we lost that, all that money it was like a ponzi scheme so it's yeah, like it was have, a ponzi scheme you have a hundred hundred people buying the same property that's right that's what i'm gonna do when i sell mars property uh, yeah yeah and maybe you can help me mortgage <laughs> of that of course stuff. yeah it's like i'm gonna sell your property there's a plot right here see that picture uh, drop that and we'll do the whole blueprint and everything that's right you know, so i remember those tough times where uh, you know he lost uh, he's, he had to start from scratch so i had seen him Sticking to his values, working hard, uh -huh. you know, it pays off. And yeah. he, he came back. So I. So he didn't get stuck just being angry and just kind of like right. blaming that circumstance to go into financial ruin. That's right. You know, I, I mean, you know what I'm talking about, right? Exactly. There are people who, are, you know, life happens, you know, circumstances happen. And we, we make mistakes, life happens. And I, we see it so much where people use that as a reason to stay stuck or to stay crashed. That's right. You know? It's like that kid that says that fell off the bike and then it's like I can't get up. It's like just get up. You just skinned your knee. Yeah, I can't get up. It's like, you know, get up, you know. And then because he never gets up, he never learns how to ride the bike. That's right. Plus he probably gets hungry because he won't if he doesn't get up, he can't go home and eat dinner and stuff like that. So That's right. You know, years later the parents go out, the kid's still lying in the street. It's like, What's going on here? Aren't you hungry? No, anyway. No, yeah. Just, or or in another way, uh it's like uh failure is yeah. is success in progress. Yeah. Like yeah, and I always say all the time, yeah. failure. I mean, you don't you learn nothing from success. That's right, right? Because success is only a proof 
Yeah, it's just the end result. Yeah, it's a proof that you actually learned something from the previous mistake. That's right. right. And it's even temporary. You will see companies that are successful, but uh -huh. it's just short-lived and mm -hmm. they fail again. So it's a process. Success is not a definite end uh, right. result. It's right. a it's a con continuous improvement. And going back to that uh, Six Sigma, for example. Uh, yeah, what is that idea. Six Sigma? Yeah, it's a, it's a good uh, thing. It's like uh, Jack Welch, which everybody probably uh -huh. knows. Uh, he. I don't know. No? So I'm not everybody. Oh, okay. Jack Welch. Who's, <laughs> Who's Jack Welch? Yeah, Jack Let Welch. me Google him. No, yeah. I can't Google yeah, him right yeah. now. No, yeah. Uh, so he's one of the business uh, gurus that he used the Japanese culture uh -huh. of uh, Kaizen. Okay, like Kaizen. change uh -huh. is good, right? Mm -hmm. So he uh, got that idea and he came up with this idea of continuous improvement. Okay. So basically what it is, is like you're trying to improve, like uh, going to really detailed uh, mm -hmm. math, where okay. I always uh, explain this analogy of, imagine you're trying to park your car in a parking, mm -hmm. right? Imagine the parking is very big, like three times as big as your car. So right. it's so easy to park. Right. But there is so much wasted space there. Yeah. So what Six Sigma does is like trying to make sure the parking is almost as big as your car. So there's very little room to be wasted. Mm -hmm. So you want to park perfectly in a parking where it's exactly the same, almost the same, mm -hmm. plus plus point one uh, space of your car. Oh, you so, have to be able to open the door. Too, yeah, yeah, otherwise. a little bit, just a little bit. You get point one inch to open the door. <laughs> Crawl out the window, my friend. The hatchback. Only hatchbacks can park here. That's right. <laughs> can't leave the car. So all Six Sigma does is trying to minimize the errors. Right. So every like every time, try to get better. It's like and an optimization strategy. Continuous. Yes. Continuous optimization. That's right. It's interesting you say Kaizen. So I mean, I can get a quick shout out to my episode number one guy who came on. His name is Kerry Hokama, and in, he uh, he calls his audience member. He has his own podcast called Kaizenites because it's all about Kaizen, it's all nice. about, you know, so he, he, he talks about that as well. So now that you mentioned Kaizen, um, maybe because it's an Asian thing, I don't know. Yeah. I get it, you know, yeah, of course. But, and, but UCLA teaches that? I mean, UCLA, they give yeah, out a, a belt system it's, around it's that? A, yeah, it's a, oh, I get it now, ha, <laughs> Kaizen, okay, okay, got it, yeah. So in an international course, it teaches you uh, basic math that is mm -hmm. applied, you know, their fish bonus strategy, there's so much to basic it. Basic math? Yeah, it's like basic uh, graphs where you okay. try to, uh, do the bell curve okay and the bell curve the idea is to try to get it closer where the errors uh -huh. per million is as little as possible so they call that basic math uh, that sounds pretty complicated <laughs> <laughs> i'm like going wait i'm an engineer that does even i was like that doesn't sound very basic to me you know just, basic to me is like one plus one equals uh, what uh, Two. <laughs> barely <laughs> that's basic right or is that if it's that if that's not basic then what is it it's like Core, no, don't even got me a start on core math. Have you, have yeah. you heard about that? No. Core math that they teach the kids? Oh, okay. The yeah, core, yeah. Sure, sure, sure. core something of another? Sure, sure. I tried to understand it. Makes no sense to me. Oh, yeah. I mean, have you have you looked at it? No. Okay, I dare I you. Just, I just barely uh, got a, I just became a father. I, oh, yeah, that's so right. I'm, You're not I'm even worried to, about yeah, that yet. Not hopefully, yet. <laughs> hopefully core math will be out of there because it will blow your mind, especially you're a numbers guy and knowing like basic math and you know fundamentals of one plus one equals two. They teach the most convoluted way. It's like saying, you know, for one plus one, in order for you to find the answer, go through Alice in Wonderland first, talk to all the animals, and when you're done and listening to the directions, then you'll find your answer. Wow. That's what I think core math is. For those of you who are listening, you government officials who created that weird math process, that's my thought on it. Not cool, huh? <laughs> anyway. I'm cool. off my soapbox now. Sure. <laughs> so, so, so the Six Sigma thing was what you then, and when did you learn that? Uh, I was doing that when I was in college. Like, uh, oh, yeah, I was like, but I you was were in like, Malaysia. Was yeah. UCLA? There? No, no, no. I did the belt oh. here. Uh, like, oh, okay, you yeah. came here. Yeah, uh, so after, you went back and forth. Yeah, yeah. Or I, yeah, I I did apply it in my uh, during the time I was doing my thesis for my masters, and mm -hmm. also ended up publishing a book about it. Uh, but afterwards, it's like you practice and then mm -hmm. you try to put a license on what you already know sort okay. of thing. Uh, mm -hmm. So, uh, because I, I wanted to make sure, you know, I know all the ins and outs and the details. But right. back then, I was fo I was hired by a, a, a school. Okay. They, were tr they had a, an online course where they had a lot of churns uh, where like a students would ro uh, enroll okay. and then they wouldn't finish the course. Uh, so they would lose their student, which was a customer. High turnover rate. Yeah. yeah. So they wanted to see what's the cause. Right. So I tried to do stuff like mystery calling. This is something McDonald's uh, used yeah, to do. Yeah, yeah, Mystery would, shopper. Yeah. You would just uh, pretend you're a customer and yeah. uh, 
uh, measure their service right. and then sort of get so I, I would uh, with the permission of the school and the students yeah. I would call in with a real issue like oh my my uh, you know my exam I didn't I wasn't able to take the exam I want to mm -hmm. get a replacement mm -hmm. so I would call and see how they would uh, deal with my with my challenge right and then rate them based on like the questionnaires I had and stuff so right. I came up with ways of and then applied the lean six mm -hmm. six Sigma tools uh -huh. to uh, to improve uh, okay. customer service and did you help them they, they 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 came up with that. Did they an listen idea. to you? I think so. It was a <laughs> higher education school, and uh, they they really uh, I think they're they're using it. Okay. Already. So okay, yeah. cool. So okay, so so let's talk about okay. So let's help let's help the audience kind of wrap their heads around what exactly do you do in That's in the right. most simplest terms, and then we'll expand on it. Um, what is it that you do now? You know your entire journey, and then that way we can give them an end point, so we can talk about how you went from Iran to Malaysia and all the way to where you are today? That's right, good question. Yeah. Thanks for asking that question, I was waiting for it. Is he gonna ask it? Yeah, of course I'm gonna ask it. It's, it's, Bobby, it's all about you, oh, sort of, nice. yeah, most of it. All right, appreciate it. So yeah, uh, what I do, I'm a mortgage guy. Okay. I, I, uh, I'm, I help people get a uh, loan mm -hmm. as long as there is a property that they, uh, the lender can attach mm -hmm. or put a lien on. Mm -hmm. So basically a mortgage, uh, which used to be called a death pledge. Is so <laughs> Why do they call it a death pledge? It's like, pay till I die. Yeah, so, but it's not as bad anymore. No. It's like, yeah. It's people like, pay off their stuff all the time. Exactly, so it's a, it's a way for it's people to- the death of the mortgage. That's right, that's true. Until the mortgage dies. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> until the mortgage dies. That's a death pledge, a pledge yeah. till the mortgage dies. That's right. So basically help people buy the home they love, uh -huh. or if they wanna be creative, they wanna uh, tap into equity they have built their mm -hmm or so we call it refinance, right. or mm -hmm. they want to buy an investment. So basically help people succeed mm -hmm. with their money story, help mm -hmm. people uh, realize their money dreams or right. uh, you know investments. And, and being in California, uh -huh. I mean that we are one of the uh, few states mm -hmm. uh, all over the nation that you know the dreams, the real estate dreams are probably one of the biggest mm -hmm. because the payoff is probably one uh, among yeah, the highest. It's a very valuable yeah. state. Yeah, it, it is. Be our own country. Like I, I remember, I was doing a, a refinance for a client of mine, uh -huh. and um, the, the, it was a, a small uh, two-bedroom townhome mm -hmm. in Manhattan Beach, mm -hmm. and they bought their home about fifty years ago. Guess what? <laughs> guess how much they bought it for? I don't know, fifty thousand dollars. Eight thousand dollars. Eight thousand yeah. dollars. <laughs> I, I need to get that time machine to go back in time oh, and, and outbid them and buy it for 10. That's right. And just sit on it and do nothing do with nothing. it. And then cash out, right? <laughs> and fast forward in time. I don't even want to wait 50 years. I'll just take the time machine back here and then just go back and it. say, uh, this is my property. It's like, you have not aged. I know. It's just, you know. And let's do it I, again. I need, I need to cash out so that way I can pay for this thing that I'm doing with my... No, That's right. Kidding. Yeah. <laughs> so and he, they were telling me back then when they were buying, Going back to the risk factor, uh -huh. they said no one was buying in Manhattan Beach. Manhattan Beach was dirt land, and kind of like Redondo, South Redondo yeah. was just all train land, That's right? right. So up. they were telling me like Hawthorne, Lawndale were like the the more favorable ones, and they just t took a risk on it. They didn't have like water systems and stuff like that fully developed. Mm -hmm. They bought it, and now the home was appraised like over a million, uh, like 1.2, 1.3 million. Mm -hmm. uh, the same house they bought, eight thousand dollars. So going back to that, uh, so capital gains on that would be stupid. Yeah, <laughs> it's just be absolutely <laughs> ridiculous. It's like, do you really want to cash out? Yeah, ten thirty one exchange. Yeah. Okay, so so here's the thing. It's like I I when I was playing in your space sure. uh, several years ago, um, and before I got out and stuff like that. You know, one of the things that a lot of my peers and my colleagues and my friends, my family were saying is like, why do you want to go into the space of mortgage? It's so competitive. And I was like, ah, you know, I'm fearless, I don't care. So I go in there and I realized that it wasn't that it was competitive. There's just a ton of people and there's a lot of mortgage people in That's right. mortgage, Sure. right? So, so how then do you then distinguish yourself from, because I'm pretty sure most people listening to this podcast probably know right off the bat two or three mortgage lenders or right. brokers or in right? their family or in their family yeah. even yeah. right well, they are mortgage brokers <laughs> or they themselves are mortgage <laughs> brokers but you know i i know better than to you know do, broker my own loan because that's just like stupid but i mean it's i don't want to deal with it anyway <laughs> but um how then but how are you then different i mean what have you found was the biggest differentiating factor what i like to call your unique value proposition when someone comes to the table they're out shopping 
course. How do they ultimately make a decision to work with you? Great. So I will always say, like in this time and age, mm -hmm. uh, I want to call it the new normal. I actually wrote a an article in a, a Scotsman Guide uh, mm -hmm. magazine. It was about uh, excelling in the new normal market. Right. So this new normal is what you exactly said. People are the millennials. I'm a borderline millennial myself. Mm -hmm. So I know that millennials are just uh, internet savvy. They want to search everything, sure. Google everything, and. They want to. They know already everything about it before they even start right. doing it. Right? Well, they think they know they everything. Think, about it. At least they know a good of, uh, deal of information. They have a good deal of information, not yeah. not necessarily a processed information or accurate. Information. Yeah, <laughs> but they've co they've collected they enough to of, get. They so they're not blind going. That's in. right. That's right. right. So what really makes a difference in this market, in my eyes, is what you provide as a service mm -hmm. like it's not about the product it's not about this because everybody's supposed to be competitive right. going back to that blue ocean a strategy idea that yeah i love that book by yeah the way. it's a great book so uh and it's getting old but the concept is not getting old yeah yeah no. so it's uh it's, i don't want to swim in a bloody ocean there's sharks there yeah so let's just stay in the blue ocean i know right let's survive yeah so you want to beat the competition so what beats the competition in customer service uh -huh. going back to uh, the reason i did the six sigma the, is it's all about providing a better service it's and continuously making continuous the service making better. better exactly okay. and, and how do you do that do you get feedback or what do you do that's I mean, right i continuously i I try to become a part of uh, like the extend extension of my clients families mm, so I'm like a I'm, household name yeah yeah okay so I'm not just a mortgage I'm not just their mortgage guy I'm, I'm part of their birthday parties I'm part of their families mm -hmm. and they know I'm there for them even like I have I've cases where clients call me they're buying something in other states uh, oh uh, they call you for advice for anyway. advice and they know mm -hmm. I don't care I want them to succeed no matter if I'm if I make a penny out of it or not, it's all about them. Mm -hmm. And by them succeeding, I succeed along with them. Mm -hmm. So by being there for them, I have times where on a Sunday night, on a holiday weekend, someone calls me and mm -hmm. says, "I'm writing an offer. I need a, a my loan uh, ready to go by tomorrow." Mm -hmm. I've had cases like that where you know we put it together, we close it in two three weeks uh, right. because we. I'm not like a nine to five uh, type of guy. I used to be like that when I was at uh, retail. But, uh, oh yeah. yeah so 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 let's let's kind of do a quick little segue. How did you get into uh, this whole area? Right. Like you know, because you did retail and everything like that's that. Right. So you started around. What did your parents do again? Uh, the, my dad was uh, in a refinery. He was an okay. engineer in uh, re, uh, oil refinery. Okay, cool. Yeah. And then uh, my mom was a teacher, and then she resigned. So oil refinery in Iran? Yeah. Why? <laughs> That's a good question. Yeah, why? <laughs> I think there's nothing but oil fields over there. There's a ton yeah, of oil fields over there. Yeah, especially with, uh, right now with all the sanctions, it's a good question. Yeah. Why? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but uh, but yeah, it's I always wanted to be good in business. Okay. Like coming from a family where uh, you know it was all paycheck to paycheck, and mm -hmm. of course my dad tried to invest in real estate, even though he had that mm -hmm. drama. But he came back. But I wanted to start with a you know a self-employed entrepreneur oh so of, you wanted to be an entrepreneur i wanted to be like that when did you realize one? that from from day one like the moment your you came out of your mom's womb like oh, yeah, i'm an entrepreneur you were shaking yeah. entrepreneur no yeah, no. I, no at what point did I you wish. i'm still like i want to say uh on on the uh, long uh, haul for the for the big uh you know every day is in and out you want to succeed and get better mm -hmm. of course was it like at nine ten yeah it was 11. i was nine years uh, and ten days old enough no, no, really yeah. oh wow that's pretty good pretty <laughs> yeah. accurate. Uh, it's like in that moment you walk up it's like entrepreneur yeah that's me i or however you yeah. say it in iran yeah uh whatever that, how do you say yeah. it? entrepreneur car offering what car means work offering means creates creator of work oh so, interesting yeah. sounds nothing like entrepreneur yeah okay <laughs> well, I'll have to have you write that down. But anyway, so so you so as a child you I just wanted to be successful. I wanted uh, for the means to be mm -hmm. not as important in my life. Mm -hmm. I wanted to come to a point where so you wanted to improve on what you grew up with in exactly. environment. Okay, so I can stick to my values even better. Mm -hmm. Contrib contribute and help others to succeed with their mm -hmm. story. And how did you figure out that in order to do a better job in conforming to your values? it was to become more successful. I mean, how did you, where did you learn that, that, okay, instead of just doing exactly what my parents did, I need to do something different. I need to do something more to get more, to be able to establish my values more and to create more for my life. 
I think the thing I saw with my uh, my parents mm -hmm. was they were not as much risk takers. Mm. So I thought by taking a little bit more of risk, mm -hmm. I mean being here thousands of miles away from where I was born. That's risk in itself. Of, yeah, kind of tells... Uh, it's like, I ain't gonna leave my country. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so it's sort of, you take the risk as long as you know what you're doing, you're uh -huh. aware of yourself, your skills, uh -huh. your limitations, and the powers vested in you, you sort of know wh where you wanna head, right. then you can succeed. But there are people where sort of those challenges, they, they hinder them from taking right. those. So I, I thought I can take more risk, yeah. and th those could be more rewarding. So huh. that was my, my, but values are, are like going back to the retail side when I was with retail. Mm -hmm. I don't want to really bash the name out where, but I, I mean, it's all about retail was, work. Did you do? It was uh, with Wells Fargo, uh, the bank. Oh, uh, oh you mean yeah. retail banking? Yes, right, yes, right, right, yes. right, right. Okay, got it. So where, uh, you know, I was there right where all these scandals were happening. You yeah, know, well, I mean, know. you don't have to say anything because the whole public, they, 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 they it's all over the news anyway. Exactly, so, so I'm not really saying anything other than what is already known. You're not a whistleblower. Someone yeah. already blew that whistle. Yeah. If you try to blow it again, yeah. it's dirty. It's like so, dirty whistle. No. Exactly. So what I, going back to the principles, I couldn't really, uh, I didn't feel that I can stick to them. Mm -hmm. uh, I have a lot of great friends over there. I still do, and some of them are still there. Okay. But uh, what I want to say is, like, it was about what is important to you, right. and what it was important to me was I can't take it anymore. So that's why. Well, it, it was violating your values. That's right. And, and it's so funny now that I know this whole story is that you were probably dying every day there. That's right. You're having your values violated because that was more important to you than money. That's right. Right. So, so you can't do that, and that's why I just left. Mm. Uh, and how was your financial situation when working at Wells Fargo? Was it good? Was it bad? It wasn't good. I yeah. did not have an, any other alternative at the time I, uh -huh. I turned in my resignation letter. Yeah. I remember it was one of those days where, uh, you know, they, they told us you have to stay to open a certain number of right. accounts and, you know. So this is what I was looking for in terms of how your money story when you know, without realizing that you put yourself in a situation that compromised your values and your mo which is part of your money story that you grew up That's with. That's right. And then when you didn't, when you didn't honor that part, you, you say no. It actually impacted your financial money flow. That's right. You weren't happy either at work, probably at home. Either. You weren't sleeping well, probably. That's right. Because your values are just like, uh, hello, yeah. this is not what we grew up to be or That's to become. Right. How can you stand go with your? How can you stand yourself going to work every single day doing that? That's right. Until you got to a point that you know enough is enough. That's right. And that's basically what. See, that's that's what's so cool about um, kind of like digging around a little bit because now your money story is really so. It's it, it helps you kind of honor that more because like oh I went against my money story when I joined this organization that's and right. every day that I went in there was like oh my god and then all of a sudden you look at your bank account it's like yeah this is not good for me. <laughs> Yeah. Not only on the financial side, but on my, my soul side, that's right. right? That's so true. So from there, you, you said, okay, no more retail, no more working for somebody else. Sure. It's back to my original path that I wanted to be an entrepreneur. Just, yeah, and then grow uh, with my clients. Mm -hmm. A lot of, uh, like, I, I got referred uh, to my new company out of one of my clients. Mm -hmm. So you grow uh, with, the, you know, with the idea and your values, you stick with them. Mm -hmm. And I, that's why I love uh, working uh, at Redondo Mortgage uh, right. Center. Where I right. Am. And when did you start working there? Uh, it was back in 2012. 2012, yeah. so that was about six years ago. Yeah. But how long ago did you finally make that leap away from retail and just try to jump into it? It was almost right uh, where things were starting to get really rough, like about a uh, few months before that, uh, okay. sort of. So 2000... 2011 11? Yeah. Okay. So, so yeah, I knew I wanted to move forward, and then I knew and uh, that I can do what is right mm -hmm. and then still be successful. Mm. So when you honored your story and, the, and your values and everything, now where you are right now, would you say this is the most successful you've ever been in your life in terms of career? So. Yeah. And it's because you got back on the wagon, so to speak, right. of the path that you already knew to be on. That's right. right. And it's so interesting that you know when we have a, an amazing story that we grow up with, but we let societal influence, or we let the world, and despite being so well-traveled, I think the biggest value that you bring to the table when you work with your clients is because you're so well-traveled. You've seen facets of different types of human behavior, cultures, and everything like that. And so what you bring to the table is probably a different level of understanding of that client that's sitting in front of you. Where they're probably coming from, and, and their also, culture. yeah, you respect the, their culture, their, their values, culture. 
yeah like going to europe you will see like how people are are like their understanding of mm -hmm. money is is like working is different like their culture is totally yeah. not the way uh capitalism here is here <laughs> yeah it's a little bit different like, they, live you gotta live your life yeah it's like quality time yeah. in their families they, mm, yeah, like, yeah yeah i remember yeah. in barcelona my uh, wife and i would be amazed that on a weekday like on a wednesday or tuesday you'll see them like after five o'clock they would clock out and they would go and party hard or like as if it's a weekend and uh, i did that last night yeah <laughs> especially for your birthday yeah. <laughs> wasn't even my birthday yet no we were having a dinner meeting just nice. kind of but but you know what's interesting is like i mean just like, like yesterday i mean just that awareness of culture is such a huge piece yesterday they served us um these burgers and then i don't know if you know this about the asian culture but they had the one each of us that ordered a burger they had the knife to cut the burger stabbed right in the middle of course kind of hold it together what does that mean in the asian culture you know we got smacked so hard every time we put chopsticks on mounds of anything right and it was because it's disrespectful to the elders it basically shows like you know cemetery thing and then you know it was it was interesting because i saw that i was like i don't know you know and there's a lot of asian people in this area i was like yeah i don't know if you're gonna like offend somebody at some That's point right. by doing that i get the practicality because the whole thing was you stab the knife in there so it makes it easy for you to cut the burger but but at the same time it's not really especially if you know most of your clients are certain uh you know like mm -hmm. if uh, you're in a certain area where you have a lot of asian cult uh, mm -hmm. customers mm -hmm. it's definitely worth your while to know their culture to, a little right. bit better so what's uh, what violates that? Yeah, because you are serving them. You might as well serve them. Yeah, well. it's like it's not like it's like you don't go to the south and you know refer to everybody by using the n word. I mean, yeah. it's like what? That's right. Yeah, it's. it's <laughs> I mean, it's not that extreme, but yeah, I mean, but it's more of respecting uh, people, <laughs> right. people uh, like mindset and uh, view, uh, viewpoint of the world, mm -hmm. and that that I, I always I was just uh, saying to my coworker today that attitude bring you latitude like mm -hmm. it's all about respect. what is that attitude brings you latitude explain yeah. what that means what you. i mean is like if you have a good attitude mm -hmm. a good behavior mm -hmm. towards other people that will help you go far mm -hmm. because they see that you respect them they respect you back they're going to help you out grow and succeed mm -hmm. in your business or mm -hmm. whatever undertaking you have so and there's more latitude and tolerance for for human error because right. at the end of the day we're human we all and, make mistakes right well, it's all about exactly for, Forgiveness, forgiveness right? right and if there's no latitude for forgiveness because your attitude sucks then you're then you're, you're sol yeah. you know well, like well, talking about big brands like uh, p uh companies that create that image for mm -hmm. for their clients as well as their mm -hmm. uh you know uh, staff mm -hmm. when they respect them when mm -hmm. uh, like the company has created that environment right. that everybody can be themselves right they can vision what they want to be and they're helping mm -hmm. them to succeed. Yeah. That sort of creates a very healthy environment for the company to succeed. Right. And that's where the clients, the customers, right. will also help you out. Like I, I, last night, a client of mine called me and they become your uh, sort of promoters. She said, uh, one of my family members traveled. They were working with another lender, I found out. Mm -hmm. I told them, stop, you gotta work with Jan because I, uh, like I know him, he's gonna help right. help you out. So she's becoming your ambassador. Almost. Exactly. <laughs> so you, word of mouth and the yeah. extent to which you're connected with them, they right. think of you. Yeah. Like uh, you know, they they know. Let's let let me uh, refer right. this client to him. Right. Is more of the attitude or the mm -hmm. networking. You are part of the family. Yeah. Because at the end of the day, the process of doing a mortgage and a loan is essentially the same I and mean, you exactly. kind of gather materials yeah. make sure you you know you do anything and then you send it to the underwriter and the underwriter That's proves right. it whatever it's the same process same. everywhere so what's the difference then right especially if you're dealing with such a huge investment you got to like the person that's right and the person's got to be willing to and you got to trust the person and you trust the person will take care of you i mean there's so many different ways to slice and dice this but i think the big underlying piece here and especially for people your peers and colleagues who might be listening wondering well how does Jan do it you know, how does he create the lifestyle they want? And I'm struggling and I'm, you know, well, probably because you have a different money story. But another thing is, I think it's just kind of understanding that it's more than just how good you are at being at, at, at mortgaging. Processes, yes, <laughs> because that's just the my, my new detail mm -hmm. of what you do. Like mm -hmm. when people ask me what you do, I don't necessarily tell them I do mortgages. I tell them I help people realize their dream mm -hmm. of, of getting their home because I really think like that because I think right. uh, 
people buying their home is mm -hmm. the biggest investment they ever make in their life. Oh yeah. And uh, so you want to be part of that process. You mm -hmm. want to really <laughs> walk with them along the because it's a stressful. Mm -hmm. You know, yeah. Uh, people have all their money on 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 the board on the line. Yeah. And then if you make a mistake and you're not uh, really caring for them right that could be a catastrophe that's or if something it, does happen can they rely on you to fix, to fix it? it right do you okay would you put yourself in their shoes and be like them like one of them like all of you against yeah. rather than you're on the other side right so that's even when there are failures if you, they feel like you're one of one of them right they they will help you and they will yeah. you know uh, it, it will be a, a a success story. Yeah. Everybody wants to succeed. I, I remember <clears throat> one of my biggest referral sources when I was still in the industry, we one of our team members completely messed up the paper one thing and it was is a huge mistake. And I think when the client and I didn't tell them they I don't know how they found out, but when they found out that I took all the commissions we made off of that deal, completely put it back to fixing things and making things right on their property and everything like that up and beyond what we anything we, we took responsible for everything not even stuff that we made a mistake on they realized at that point that it was more than about the money that's right to us that's right and so they actually became one of our biggest referral sources because you got to work with this guy that's right and then they tell him the story and the guy's like oh my god this is kind of so i think it's those little tiny moments that you accumulate over time i bet you though as if you go back to your portfolio and you kind of look through all the different success stories i have there's going to be a a common denominator, a common thread to all as to why you're so unique in your space. And I think the biggest challenge with most mortgage people, anybody in real estate, there's just so many of you guys out there. How do you separate yourself? That's right. You know, I mean, yeah, you can put out a ton of content and stuff like that, but how do you? And I think there's something what I'm picking up on, and on just our conversation here today, and plus the previous conversation we have. Yeah, you're a lovable, affable guy. You're friendly. You're nice. And I think there's something to be said about those family values that you bring to the table and the fact that you've been able to cross-section this all over the world in your travels. And that is what people are going are really kind of investing their time and energy into to help them to create the best experience ever. Not just for this one transaction, but for a lifetime. You That's know? right. It's always nice to have an international friend. That's right. You know, wherever always, you go. Yeah, and especially living in the U.S., it's pretty much everybody is an immigrant. I know, point, right? Yeah. Anybody <laughs> says otherwise, yeah. I will open up the history books for you, and yeah, I'll tell you what's just, going on. Uh, facts are <laughs> facts, right? <laughs> I have so many stories. Yeah. That's not even funny. <laughs> but, That's another time. But. but but traveling helps us understand mm -hmm. here, uh, like be more successful yeah because everybody has family somewhere overseas at sure. some point uh, that might come over yeah and then <clears throat> and all that is just knowing their culture understanding mm -hmm. it, respecting it it's 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 been tremendously helpful in in mm -hmm. everything i've done so far it's yeah like, like even now if i say I need, i'm gonna go to a malaysia can you give me some pointers you'd be able to just have, throw everything out yeah i have friends there that i i i, I miss them dearly i mean they're Sort of like, so like we'll go out there and we'll go. He says, "I'll go with you." Yeah, I, I can take you. Let's close this loan first, and then yeah, I'll go with you. Yeah, we go to all the Chinese restaurants and there you go. Are you saying that because I'm Chinese? No, oh, okay. I, that was my favorite. Okay, <laughs> I was gonna say I was like, the, hey, no, no just kidding. No. But my favorite restaurant was a, a dim sum place. We would go for uh, uh, morning, and they had it was a very mom and pop type uh -huh. of restaurant where they would just uh, serve this mm -hmm. phenomenal dim sums which I miss so much yeah and they have something that is unique to Chinese in Malaysia mm -hmm. it's called bakute bakute and bakute is uh, it's a uh, with pork they make something really cool uh -huh. and it's really awesome wow so, bakute yeah, yeah. I wonder if they serve that here did you ever find that here bakute? I don't think they have it here really yeah. I bet you we gotta look for it and yeah. google it bakute <laughs> in Redondo Beach no I'm kidding yeah. <laughs> okay cool so um, Believe it or not, we're at the we're almost at the top of the hour. I want to make sure that because for sure someone's probably listening to this either today or down the road, and they say, "I really like this guy." You know, I'm dealing with a really crappy mortgage guy, and they're all crappy born, so I'm not saying anything that's weird. But and I and I I think this is the guy for me. How do they connect with you? How do they reach out to you um, to be able to have? You know to be able to develop that relationship because sure. i think this is really it's about a relationship that's right that's okay right. if you're thinking of it as a transactional thing then you're do, you're approaching this whole huge investment piece all wrong you need that relationship that's so how right. do they develop that relationship how do they reach so out? they can always re i'm i'm pretty uh like available online so mm -hmm. they can always email me at uh yon a y n n yes at uh -huh. redondomortgage.com redondomortgage 
Spreaker.com. I'm going to put that in the Spreaker yeah. chat. so that and, and they can also call me uh, uh, at my cell phone, 310-291-8122. Wow. Do you have two different phones? Is this your only this cell phone? This is my only cell phone. And okay. then, uh, Are you okay with me putting yeah, it up? Yeah, okay. go ahead. And then it's, it's online anyways. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> and then I'm on uh, like Facebook, uh, like I have a page, Jan Part of Redondo Morgan. Yeah, you're actually very active in social media, which I like to see. Yeah, yeah. and uh, sort of, uh, you know, on Twitter. Uh, so I have a blog where- You wanna I, give a shout out to your social media person that's here today? Yeah. That's doing the social media? Yeah, Sarah is phenomenal. She's been, she's been so kind to come in to help me to expand the, the outreach for this event. Uh, uh -huh. And uh, which I was very excited about, and uh, she's she's great. So uh, and then Twitter, uh, you know, they can just look my name up, and mm -hmm. they'll, uh, they'll find me. Awesome. Sure. Okay. Yeah. Cool. So uh, yeah. So c reach out to Jan Y A N N at RedondoMortgage dot com, or you can call him at three one zero two nine one eight one two two. He's fearless. Puts his cell phone out there, and he only has one cell phone. I would actually put out like you know my my burner phone yeah. you know and so in case it gets out of control i can just That's throw right. it away or something like that i, I get to smash it <laughs> <laughs> and, and and it's a very cool thing because you know uh for those of you who are watching the you, this is going to be the last time that you see this show in this environment because we are moving growing expanding into a whole new studio space and so hopefully the sound will be even better. We're upgrading the equipment even more. And so um, because um, you you came here on the last one, I, I actually want to make sure that maybe we'll have you back again to, uh, to talk about a specific thing around the around your industry. Today is more about who is who are you and and how why you know why people should you know like you because like I said, it's the relationship, right? That's right. You know, Getting to know the person first. And then yeah. Be yeah. Then the rest will just be easy. Yeah, the rest will be easy, and we could talk about specific things that you know that may come up and stuff like that. That's so right. I would love to have you come back because it was fun. I don't I know. I really enjoyed it. Thanks for. Yeah. Having if me. there's one thing you want to leave, let's leave one thing for two things. Okay. The one thing for people who are considering, you know, buying a home or refining and stuff like that. What is your take about what's going on right now? And then maybe one thing for your peers and colleagues who are struggling because you're obviously thriving. So mm -hmm. struggling, what you can do to kind of like inspire them to like turn things around for themselves. Beautiful. Yeah. So the first question I would say for all the potential clients, at any point, all mm -hmm. of us will purchase a home. Mm -hmm. uh, or we want to purchase a home, we own a home, we want to deal with a mortgage at some point. So I would say it always in uh, a very smart idea rather than rent and pay someone else's mortgage mm -hmm. to at least own your own home. And then, you know, uh, don't pay rent if you can't. At least uh, get to know the details of that option. Know what it takes to own a home. At, at least be ready if you, uh, if you. And they can talk to you about maybe coming up with a game plan. Of course. For that. Yeah. Okay. It come could, with strategy. I've had clients where it took us a few years uh, for mm -hmm. them to even pull the uh, trigger and, and. And you stay with them the whole yeah. way. Yeah. Held their hand. Yeah, they call me. Yeah, the birthday it's parties. Scenarios. Yeah, stuff like that. So yeah. we can wash uh, the cars. That's right. Yeah. yeah. Like that. Bring cookies. <laughs> Bring cookies. Yeah. So so it's, it's always good to know your options. Okay. Always having an option versus not having an option mm -hmm. is always the better is to have an option. Mm -hmm. So know your options, no matter. And even if you're working with a lender, check the other lenders, or if some, if you are referred to someone, check out and see if. They can do something for you, can help mm -hmm. you out. So, so at least we, have a basically saying have a plan. That's right. Have Even if you don't, if you're not in a circumstance where you can buy a home, at least have a plan. Have a plan and, and at least know that your guy, your mortgage guy mm -hmm. is there with you, is ready to take your call when you need mm -hmm. them. They're not like, oh, sorry, I'm on. I remember there was once uh, the, I had pre-qualified someone mm -hmm. and I was in Paris with my wife. Mm -hmm. It was 1 a.m. Mm -hmm. and I received a phone call and it looked from California, so I picked it, and it was a uh, listing agent wanted to cross qualify uh, mm -hmm. or double check the loan, mm -hmm. and I took the call, and because of the fact that I took the call and we had a great conversation, and she already knew me, uh, she, she accepted their offer. Nice. So, so stuff okay. like that. Had I lost that phone call, it would it uh, probably would have. It would be impression happened, right? of like this lender is not even available because yeah. uh, he she was calling me at a, an okay time uh, mm -hmm. here in California. She wouldn't imagine that I'm overseas and it's one a.m. So stuff like that. Have someone that is there with you mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. is is going to be working uh, if if you're a realtor. If, right. Uh, you know, it's work, working alongside with you if you're a mm -hmm. client. Uh, you know, uh, that guy you can rely. Mm -hmm. So that okay. would be the first question. Right. 
The second one is uh, what I would share as a my humble, my two cents, basically. Your two cents yes. to, your, <laughs> to your peers and colleagues yeah, out there that's who are. That's right. So I would say just, just be out there. Availability is my, my key uh, to success. Uh -huh. And I, I always tell my uh, peers, like I work with a lot of realtors in the uh -huh. area. Like I do cross qualifications for the listings. I do pre-qualifications for the buyers, like anything regarding mortgage for the right. sellers or buyers. And what I do is I'm out there. If they pick up the phone and call me on a Sunday, they know that I will answer the phone. Or if I'm on the phone, I'll call them back. So right. be out there, always uh, put your best foot forward. Mm -hmm. And if times are tough or like rates are changing or market mm -hmm. is changing, as long as you're out there, you're reaching, you're knocking on doors, mm -hmm. ask and you shall, you shall be given, right? Mm -hmm. So, so it's always just be out there and be there to, to help your clients right. and your, uh, you know, your, your co-workers it's kind of like having a store in a strip mall but you never open the door that's right or you never <laughs> i mean I, I mean that's kind of what happens that's right? right a lot you of know? times like they're asking for business you call them and they're not there and they don't return your call so what uh, how but, could you uh, yeah how, how, how could, do you expect to grow your business that's right. right so it and it's so it's not a it's not a difficult thing to do you just have to be willing to be commitment out there. commitment to that's, be seen yeah just commitment right. to your promise like mm -hmm. a pre-approval that i give out I try to honor that. Right, like and if any, you if you're not willing to do that, should you stay a mortgage broker? I would recommend doing something else. Maybe uh, clock in, clock out somewhere else. Oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> just get a get a uh, paycheck to paycheck job or something that yeah. doesn't require as much commitment. But right. I would say commitment. And there's nothing wrong with that either. Yeah, you know, it's, it's great. A, it's a, yeah, so, it's, a, it's yeah. a choice. So. It's, it's a choice. But if you make that choice, everybody's a genius, right? Mm -hmm. It's just uh, the you need to find out what what you are. Uh, what's your forte? Basically. Right, and where to apply that genius. Yeah. Yeah, so, I love that. Yeah. That's so cool. That's a great way to kind of like wrap things up a little bit. So thank you so thank much you so much for, for being me. on I the really show. enjoyed it. Yeah, make sure you stick around a little bit after. We can debrief and everything like that and say goodbye to the YouTube people. But that's our show for this week, ladies and gentlemen and kids and uh, any animals out there who like to listen to this podcast. I don't know if there are any. Again, if you found this episode to be valuable and know of someone else that could benefit from what we talked about today, share it. Make sure you subscribe to us on iTunes or give us a thumbs up on YouTube live. And we even have a Facebook group called The Money Lab. So join us there to dive even deeper into bad money story elimination strategies. So that's a wrap. Have an amazing week to applying the knowledge from today. I'm out of here to go to my favorite place that I go every year for my birthday, Disneyland. And, we, and we'll catch you next week on The Money Lab Live podcast where we have financial lifeguard and fellow money coach Christine Lucan. This is Way from the Six Figure Academy and Jan Pard from Redondo Mortgage yeah. signing off. All right. Goodbye, everybody. It's money, make a world go round. All right. Awesome. That's done there. YouTube land, thank you guys. For those of you who came on or those of you who come up afterwards to watch, thank you for watching the show. Again, take it all in. This is the last time we're here in the studio. We're going to change things up. It's going to be even bigger, better, and better i think so something like that sounds all right thanks again Jan. thank you so much all right cool enjoyed it yep all right thanks cool see everybody we'll catch you guys the next time